I'm Colonel John Keenan, United States Marine Corps retired, editor of the Marine Corps Gazette, and I'm here today with General Tony Zinni, author of the new book, Before the First Shots Are Fired. In the book, sir, you mentioned how Eisenhower's president formed a group. It's not a direct descendant, but today we have uh, the Security Council, uh, the National Security Council that uh, advises the president. It, it almost seems like there are en uh, organizations and processes in place, but they don't seem to be working. Well, each president has designed his own way of doing this. Uh, it was actually Truman, one of Eisenhower's uh, predecessors, who uh, immediate predecessor who designed the National Security Council and uh, that was uh, codified in the 1947 National Security Act. So Eisenhower had a National Security Council but he wanted something else. The Solarium Group was right. select few uh, people like George Kennan and others. They all brilliant. All brilliant strategists and Eisenhower never asked a question or made a comment. He had the issues presented to them, the crisis if you will, he wanted people that thought differently. He wanted to hear the debate and the arguments. And, and from there, he wanted to see the full range of options and all the arguments. Some presidents since then have had something equivalent. Uh, Kennedy had his XCOM e executive committee that he formed, ma mainly of, of government people, when he handled the Cuban missile, missile crisis. Some presidents uh, take the counsel of one individual. I mean, even back to Woodrow Wilson had George House. George, uh, House. Uh, yeah, and he was not even a member of government. But we know the Kissingers, the Brzezinski's, uh, maybe even more lately, uh, how Vice President Cheney and Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld probably had President Bush's ear more than anybody else. And maybe you didn't have the other side, maybe more represented by somebody like the Secretary of State at the time, uh, uh, Colin Powell. So there's no one answer. The personality of the president, I think, is important. The experience level of the president is important. But the idea is you have to hear many voices build a full range of options, hear the arguments, pros and cons, make sure the intelligence is asked for in a way that gives you ground truth in the full range, not cherry picked or not asking questions that sort of are based on predetermined agendas or decisions that have been made. You know, sir, uh, that leads to another interesting point you made in the book that if you get the strategy right, if you get the operational design right, uh, you get the goals right, you set up the Lance Corporal on the ground for success. Um, it seems that that is a very difficult thing to do uh, in terms of counsel to the president, what the president wants to hear. Um, it really all comes back, what you're saying is less uh, the, who's in power than his methodology for arriving at a strategy. That that's, and that's not codified, but that's critical. Yeah, you know, I was able to do an assessment both in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, after I retired. And the one thing I kept hearing, even from the generals, is I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, imagine then when you get to the captains and yeah. the sergeants. Oh, gosh, yeah. You know, and it just, uh, as I mentioned in the book, when I got to Afghanistan, the war had been going on for 10 years. There were 10 different commanders in 10 years. Right. And, and so that, that makes everything change. We couldn't decide whether we wanted counterinsurgency, we wanted counterterrorism, you know, CT light, CT heavy. Everybody had a new idea. And what I was seeing is that impacted uh, at that level of the captain of the sergeant, right. changing rules of engagement, changing right. operational direction. And, and that really stems from not having a clear strategy because an operational design has to be nested in a strategy. I think it, it's said well by some of the commanders out in both Iraq and Afghanistan, you can't shoot your way to victory. There has to be something more than that. We can, you know, students of military history will tell you that maybe as great as, the, say, the German army was, the, the strategy was bad. Yeah. And so they weren't, by operational skill, going to be able to overcome bad strategy. And, and I think that's true. Bullets won't... Uh, uh, won't make a difference if the planning and the strategy are not there or they're inadequate or they're insufficient or they're playing wrong. Well, one of, the, one of the points I think that's well taken is that as part of your strategy, uh, there has to be a clear definition of goals and end state. And, uh, and we would say, uh, you know, in the military, an exit strategy. Mm -hmm. Looking at events today, particularly in, in Iraq, et cetera, um, 
if you could craft the end state and the exit strategy, if, I, if you don't mind me asking, sir, what would it be? What would you advise? Well, let me take a step back. Sometimes, and, and I understand this, sometimes you can't see the end state. I, I agree. I, I think that's the case. Uh, and, and, and so if you can't see the end state, be clear that you're going to minimize the impact of an unclear end state. Let me give you an example, and that's the first Gulf War. Uh, we weren't going to Baghdad. I think the, the, the Bush administration, H.W. Bush, uh, clearly saw we don't want to inherit Iraq and all its problems. We want to kick them out of Kuwait. We want to been, make sure that we reduce them to the point where they're not a threat to anybody in the region or allies. Uh, and we degrade Saddam's capability. But we don't want to take ownership of, of Iraq. So a containment policy was put in, which was very effective. It com you know, we completely took out his air defense system. He was a threat to nobody. He had no WMD program, uh, which we knew by the end uh, uh, of, uh, of the 90s that that was the case, uh, despite the fact we used it as an excuse. So sometimes if you can't see an end state, you know, we couldn't see an end state in how we were going to deal with the Soviet Union or Red China uh, during the Cold War. But we understood we needed a, a, a strategy. The strategy was deterrence and containment. We would stop them everywhere they attempted, especially using a communist-inspired insurgency. We would keep our powder dry. You know, the NATO alliance would be strong. We would demonstrate our ability to react. Remember the reforger exercises right, exactly. and things like that? The exercises the Marines did on the flanks in Norway and the Mediterranean. So the end state doesn't necessarily have to be a clear end. It has to be something that defines how it could be something that if you can't see that end state or you see the cost of it, in that case it would have been nuclear war, uh, how do you get to a point where you manage it very effectively uh, until an end state becomes clearer? Now, I think President Reagan clearly saw the end state in the end. I talked to members of his cabinet that said uh, uh, by the time they met in Iceland, uh, Gorbachev, he saw the collapse of the Soviet Union. And then the question became, how do you manage it so it's a soft landing and it doesn't uh, right. become disruptive? So, you know, we can probably look at North Korea right now, Iran and others. It's difficult to see an end state. We certainly want to avoid a conflict, but we certainly have to have a policy in there and an understanding that right now our objectives are to contain and deter a any possible. So I think that, that that's a, a, a viable answer. Now, in the case of ISIS and what we have today, I think where we're confused here is we don't see the immediate threat. The immediate requirement, the immediate end state in the first part of the strategy is to get ISIS out of Iraq. I think it takes ground forces, and I think it takes U.S. ground forces. The president's resistant to that, uh, but I don't see how else you can do it. There's no ground force in a position to do that. You can bomb Syria all you want. You can work with the Iraqi government to change their their uh, ability to be more inclusive and uh, reach out to the uh, to the Sunnis and the Kurds. That's a long time. But that's a, those are long term goals. There's, there's a short term objective here or end state, uh, and I don't see how that's going to be accomplished without ground forces. And it's going to take ours at least representative on the ground so you can really build a coalition. You, we have never had success with the Renan Army. Yeah. As much as we're in love with the idea that we had special forces guys on horseback with the Northern Alliance, and we tried to do a, Afghanistan on the cheap, they let Al Qaeda go. We missed Al Qaeda at Tora Bora because we did not follow the PAL doctrine and put in overwhelming force like we did in the first right. Gulf War, and we would have trapped them. Right. You know, uh, sir, uh, having been a combatant commander in, in the Marine Corps today, relevance that seems to be the word of the day uh, how do we main we may remain relevant I, I think we'll remain ready that's part of our ethos uh, and as we move into constructs like EF 21 etc but from your perspective uh, what does the Marine Corps bring to the combatant commander that makes us a value to the combatant commander I, I think there's several things that the Marine Corps brings and, uh, and this is not just from a marine combatant commander looking at his own service this is what I learned of being a component commander and and, and being with Marine Forces answering to other combatant commanders from other services. I think they like the idea that there's a force that's very flexible. F 
flexible in its organization, uh, ability to take on missions that are non-traditional, that, that are difficult and complex to understand, uh, that we're, we're very efficient, we, we can do things in a very, of course we use the term expeditionary, which may be overused, but the value of being expeditionary is you can do it in an austere way, you can do it in a way that uh, effectively is easy to apply you and then uh, pull you out if necessary. Uh, we don't need a lot on the ground to get things done. Uh, I think the flexible mindset that we have, the, 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 what I call the Darwinian approach, which is important for military units in this day and age, is the adaptability yeah. on the ground. I mean, you can see General Mattis, General Conway, you know, all, the, all those uh, Marines that were in Ambar province, Helmand province in Iraq and Afghanistan, how quickly they understood and grasped the situation on the ground, uh, you know, and were able to uh, very quickly uh, adapt their their tactics, if you will, the way they operated. Uh, you know, when General Mattis got on the ground very quickly, he understood this wasn't a time for full combat gear and total focus on combat operations. There was still a security requirement, but he very quickly made sure that the people on the ground understood, as he said, I can be your best friend or your worst enemy. But packed into that statement is a lot. Sure. You know, and, and it means a lot, and it, and it is sort of a, a symbolic of our uh, relevance and our flexibility uh, on the ground. So I think that's the strength of the Marine Corps and going forward, as you said, relevance is key. My advice to future commandants uh, and others is understand the needs of the combatant commander and be as useful to the combatant commander as you can. Be willing to, to do windows. You know, th right. there's a lot of little crappy jobs out there uh, that may not be long term. You may, may not need to structure something specifically for it for it, but you can adapt to it very quickly, and because of the way we task organize in the Marine Corps, uh, there's a lot of appeal to using us. We don't have a big footprint on the ground either. So there is a niche that combatant commanders need filled, and the Marine Corps is the ideal force for that. I think we have to work closely with the Navy now to redefine our, our role. We are a naval force. We should remain one. That's, that's part and parcel of who we are, part of our character too. Uh, that relationship needs to be expanded. It, it's not just amphibious operations in the old traditional ascent, uh, uh, sense. It is projection of power from the sea in a very much more broadened uh, context. And we ought to think in those terms and be innovative. The last time we did this was toward the end of the Cold War at the maritime strategy. When I, th I think that was the last time the Navy and the Marine Corps really came together. You know, we're like a family, we'll have our own internal disputes, but we are a family. Uh, and this naval family ought to do a, sort of a renaissance in the maritime strategy, I think, and begin to think about this new kind of world. I think naval power has a big role to play, if not the top role of our military forces. And now's the time to come up with that. It, you know, back when we were working the maritime strategy, and, and we are working that closely, we, have so, we had so many innovative ideas. Nobody would have thought of putting carriers in fjords in Norway. You know, the, the imagination uh, of how we were going to keep a, one foot in the water, one foot on the land, and work the flanks in the Cold War. I was on the CNO's um, uh, strategic studies group, and at the time, Admiral Trost wanted to understand if the Soviets were reacting to the maritime strategy. We, were, we had opened up to us all sorts of highly classified material on Soviet thinking and writing in reaction to what was coming out. They were reacting. We were causing concern. They did see vulnerabilities on their flanks that we were exploiting. Uh, so I would encourage the Marine Corps and the Navy to reform that. We used to do annual war games. We, went, we got together to develop the from the sea uh, doctrine. I think we need to resurrect all that. Not that it would be the same, it's a different world, but sure. that kind of thinking and cooperation I think is right. important. I think, I think those are words that should be heeded. I mean, clearly, um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, we need to remain a learning organization, learning on the ground. Um, however, as you, we do windows, but we have to f find what the combatant commander needs and then fill it, not as a matter of service preservation, but of service to the nation. Yes. Yeah, I, you know, service... You know, we get we get excited about that. Every time there's an affordability issue, there's going to be cuts to the defense budget, all services get nervous. Uh, the Marine Corps, is, as General Krulak, the senior General Krulak said, you know, is, is one of those services that constantly has to redefine itself. 
But that's healthy, I think. You're redefining yourself in a changing world and your applicability to that, uh, providing a, an element of power for the United States in that changing world. So I think that constant reasserting and reassessing your value is important. Uh, I would say right now is a golden opportunity for the Marine Corps because it's the kind of confused world where a force like the Marine Corps, for all the reasons we've been talking about, can have a lot of relevance, right. the term you use. Yeah. General Zinni, thank you very thank much. You, John. We've been talking with General Zinni, author of Before the First Shots Are Fired. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you. And for your insight. Thank you. Semper Fi. Semper Fi.